Hey everyone, welcome to this week's live Support Ops Hangout. I'm your host, Chase Clements. Uh, so we've got our full crew back this week, which is going to be exciting. Uh, if you're watching the video version, then you'll probably notice that Jeff isn't here yet, but we've been told that he's in <laughs> some snowmobile something or another in Boston trying to get to his house. So hopefully he'll be back in uh, just a minute. He's promised to be on this, this episode. Um, all the way from Hawaii, which is really exciting still, is uh, Carolyn. And again, if you're watching the YouTube, then you should at least, like, be able to see that Carolyn's on her balcony out in Hawaii. You can probably hear the birds in the background if you're listening to the audio version. It's probably just paradise out there right now, right? It's a little bit like paradise, yes. <laughs> oh, and then we've got my uh, fellow Chase in plaid with a beard. I think that's what we decided that we both were. It's basically Chase's in plaid with beard. Um, Chase Livingston from over at Automatic. Uh, just a little jealous of Carolyn, right? That's right. I was there a couple weeks ago, though, so I uh, I'm not super jealous. Well, okay, so I'm just super jelly, evidently. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. I've got the month off, so suckers. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, you win. <laughs> I will say. Uh, so for those of you that that didn't get that inside joke, there's a uh, with Basecamp. Every three years, we get 30 days off uh, just to recharge and refresh as a sabbatical. So that's been my entire month of March, and it's been absolutely fantastic. If your company doesn't have some kind of you know two weeks off or a month off or however you want to do it, uh, they definitely should because it's it's really great for just kind of clearing your head and getting back in the game. Uh, speaking of getting in the game, Jeff is now with us. Jeff, how are you? Don't mind me, just sneaking in. Yeah, it's kind of hard to... Well, the audio version, again, I guess it's easy to sneak in, but the video version, you kind of pop up and make this big entrance, so... Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, so with all of that fun stuff out of the way, uh, let's dive into the topic for this week's show. Um, we're looking at how, um, how policies get enacted, I guess is, is a good word, how they get created for a team, uh, at what point do they get created, and what do those kind of policies look like? And, and then, you know, also what... When do you use policies? Because um, they're not going to be applicable for every situation. Um, so you, you've probably already got, if you started a company at all and have some kind of online product, you've probably got pretty standard ones, probably um, privacy policies, uh, terms of service, that kind of stuff. So we're, we're not going to really talk about those. We're going to leave those to the side. We're more interested in the ones that are going to vary from company to company. The ones like um, how you do refunds, when you give refunds, um, how do you do account ownership changes, which we've touched on a little bit before, so I'll make sure to put that episode in the show notes. Um, but how do you get to decide who can take over an account, and, and when does that um, kind of decision have to be made? Those are the ones, like I mentioned, that are going to pretty much vary from company to company because each company is, is unique in that and how they want to handle things like that. So we're going to look at what the policies should look like, when you should even have them in the first place, um, and, and all that fun stuff. So let's start with Chase Livingston over at Automatic. Um, Chase, when you first, uh, you know, when you train somebody that's new to the Automatic team, uh, or maybe when you got trained yourself, what was one of the first policies that they kind of drummed into you that was, hard and fast, you, this is exactly how you have to do it, there's no room for judgment or anything like that. Does, does Automatic have anything, any policies like that? The only thing that um, we really have, and it's more because we don't have that much control over it, is um, domain registration. Mm -hmm. um, since we allow users to register domains through us as a registrar on WordPress.com, um, ICANN, which is the internet corporation for assigned names and numbers, basically that governs um, all domain name registrations on the internet. They have some pretty hard and fast rules about um, when you can issue refunds, how you like um, redeem an expired domain, um, you know what kind of money that costs, and everything like that. So that's one of the big ones that, that we have to deal with. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, that like I said, that's one of the one of the first ones when we talk about refunds with a new trainee or whatever that, that gets brought up. Um, but yeah, other than that, things are a little bit more um, flexible and and uh, kind of case by case basis, I guess. So you kind of pulled out the, the refund one there. So is there a different procedure in place, a different policy in place for, like, the domain refunds, the ICANN refunds versus just regular kind of like a monthly WordPress charge kind of thing? Yeah, so um, as far as some of our other upgrades go, like our space upgrades and our um, other uh, various upgrades we have, um, our, I guess, general policy is 30 days. You know, we'll, we'll offer a refund, but... Um, Usually, if it's um, 
you know, even past 30 days um, and the user, you know, wants a refund or whatever, we're happy to do that um, regardless because, you know, for us it, it's not a big deal, whereas with the domain registrations we have to, you know, abide by ICANN rules, otherwise we might lose our ability to, to register domains. So, um, yeah, with, with most of our other upgrades, um, we don't necessarily stick to hard and fast rules. It's kind of just up to the happiness engineer um, to use, you know, his or her best judgment um, when it comes to refunding some of our other upgrades. Yeah, so on the, the smaller scale of the company, as far as that goes uh, with Buffer, uh, Carolyn, when it comes to Buffer, do you, are there any hard and fast policies like that? Is there anything that when you, you know, if you're going through Buffer boot camp that you, you have to kind of, make sure people realize this is something that there's not a lot of leeway with? Mm. Um, yeah, I, that Chase brings up a great one. Um, yeah, so refunds were, were pretty much use your best judgment. Um, but, uh, yeah, the one that, um, that we have to be sort of careful about is turning off two-factor authentication for somebody. Um, so sometimes people will say, um, you know, uh, uh, can you turn off two-factor authentication, I can't access my account, um, or I lost my phone, or this, that, or the other thing happened. Um, and we, we do have some troubleshooting tech uh, options for that, but um, yeah, for the most part, we have to be pretty careful about that, because if they can just ask us to turn it <laughs> off, then it's not very effective. Um, so yeah, policy is maybe a, a strong word, but we do have a process for that um, that we follow. So um, I guess that's, that's a good example of one. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's one of those where if somebody writes in and says, oh, but we're best friends, you should totally turn it off. You can't just be like, look. I, I mean, there's, there's, like you said, there's this process in place to make sure that that extra layer of security isn't uh, breached in any way. Exactly. So, uh, since we're, we're kind of sticking uh, a little bit, because uh, you mentioned refunds, it's, it's used best judgment with Chase, you know, uh, Chase Lemmings and refunds use the best judgment. Um, let, let's swing over to Jeff. Jeff, when it comes to Wistia, is, is that kind of the same way? I think I vaguely remember talking about this on a show a little bit with you before. Um, like you've got some kind of like 30 days, no questions asked kind of thing or something like that? Yeah, so um, I, th I think we are pretty much use your best judgment. Um, but I think that there should be a smart default in place. So I guess kind of similar to what Carolyn was saying, it's it's not that I, I do think that process can be a um, can be a uh, tough word because a lot of people think that means you know something negative like oh I, I have to do this every time and I can't adjust it. I I, I feel like um, there there are co there are costs if you set a process and there are costs if you don't set a process. Right, the cost of you set a process is like everyone just starts doing exactly that process and never break it. And customers on those like edge cases where you really should be going above and beyond for a refund, it doesn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. The other one is, uh, to me, a little bit scarier, especially as we grow, is like every single issue, people are spending a ton of cycles thinking about what they should do. And so if I can... Uh, alleviate the first one, the one where everyone just does exactly what's in the process and they never deviate from that. If I can alleviate that one by just saying like at the, the top in bold letters when we talk about the processes we try to follow, if the, the first thing that people see is that like none of these are perfect. None of these describe everything and also the people who made them are totally fallible, aka like me and some other members of our customer happiness leadership. It's like we don't know what we should be doing necessarily, and we also can't cover all the edge cases. So when somebody encounters something and they, they kind of think a little dip, deeper on it and they're like, oh, I don't think I should do it that way um, in this case, they should feel empowered to do that. Um, but I, I think when we say, like, use your best judgment for every case without a smart default, um, it requires just a lot of extra work on things that you really wouldn't describe as high-priority work. Um, Transferring ownership is hard from a security perspective. It's not something that I want Wistia to be known for being really good at. Mm -hmm. I don't want, yeah, I don't want us to be really known for, for being really great when it comes to uh, transferring ownership or even refunds. Um, I, I would prefer for that to be like a smart default that we've chosen and execute really well against that. 
Yeah, I like the the idea of, of, of the smart default here um, because we can do the same thing with Basecamp for um, just kind of stick with the refund policy for just a second here. Um, so our refund policy, for, for lack of a better word here, is it, if it's like in the first like three months, it's one of those where, so you try Basecamp out, you, di- you didn't like it, you forgot to cancel, and three months later you finally like look at your credit card statement for the first, like the first time in three months, and you're like, oh yeah, I should have canceled that. You email us, it's cool. We're going to cancel, we're going to refund, everything's fine. Um, it's when you get into cases more like, oh, I've had this charge on my card for a year now, or two years, or three years, which does happen. I, I don't know how. If you don't look at your credit card statement for three years, that's just uh, whatever. But I have seen cases like that. At that point, you have to kind of step back and go, all right, we're, our, our smart default in this case, you know, pretty much no questions asked in the first three months or so, um, that doesn't really apply here. So you've got to kind of figure out some kind of middle ground to work with the customer on. Uh, I, I think a lot of it, too, is making sure that those smart defaults are known, like the customer has easy access to them. If you're, the, you know, if only your internal team has access to this policy, then it kind of gets a little... Uh, secretive, I guess, for lack of a better word. Like, customers are like, oh, yeah, I I didn't know you had a policy on refunds. I didn't know you had a policy on account owners, uh, like, ownership changes and that kind of thing. So we do, uh, we made sure to put those policies up on the Basecamp site so that whenever we talk about that with a customer, we can point them to that and they'll know that, hey, it's not some secretive thing that we're just making up. I mean, this is kind of the standard uh, kind of thing that we do. Um... Which I guess brings up a, another question. So Chase, you know, I, I'm guessing that the I can stuff that we're talking about, that all is pretty much public and that kind of thing. But are there any other policies that customers know about, like upfront when they're when they're going with WordPress? Is there anything like, you know, if uh, if I sign up for a WordPress.com trial, is there any kind of policy that you're going to make sure that I know about before signing up? Um, I guess for a trial. Um Usually, um, we would like let the user know most of our. We don't. I mean, since we have you know the basically no questions asked refund. Um, I mean, we say within 30 days, but really, um, you know, we can give it to you past that. Um, we don't do a ton of trials um, because you could just ask for a refund after a couple weeks or something like that if you really wanted to, and we would just refund you. Um, we do occasionally do trials on some things like 14 day trials, but usually we'll say like at the end of the 14 days. Um, if you don't, you know, cancel your trial or whatever, then we'll go ahead and, you know, start billing you for that service or upgrade or whatever it is so you don't, um, you know, have to worry about the service lapsing if you don't, you know, enter your credit card number immediately or whatever. Um, so that's something, you know, obviously we would let a user know up front, like if they're signing up for a 14-day trial, you know, hey, we're going to charge your credit card at the end of those 14 days. Um, if you decide not to sign up or if you decide that you don't like it, then, you know, log in and cancel it after 7 or whatever you, you know, or even after 14 if that's what you decided. And, I mean, you know, we can still refund you um, after 30 days of of being charged anyway. So um, I guess that's one that comes to mind that we would let users know about up front. Um, Another one that that comes to mind is a little bit different is um, if you decide to delete a WordPress.com site that, you've created. Um, we try to make it very clear that, um, you know, when you go through the process, it's like a three or four step process that if you delete the site, the site is really deleted, you're going to lose the content because if you're asking us to delete it, that means you don't want it out there anymore and, and you don't want us to hold on to it. Um, and so we try to make that very clear with like three or four different clicks and check boxes and that kind of thing. Like this will really be deleted please understand that's what you're doing, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I guess that's, you know, another one sort of that we try to make sure users know up front um, how we handle that um, so that they can, you know, either one, be comfortable with the fact that we're, you know, removing their data and they don't have to worry about it, or two, if that's not exactly what they meant to do, they can, you know, turn around quickly and and not, you know, go through with that process. Yeah. Carolyn, how important is it to set those kind of policies in writing? Like, at should you, you know, should you give your one of your support team members, one of your your happiness heroes, a, a chance, you know, maybe an afternoon or so, to go out and actually write down some of these policies and make sure everyone knows? Is, is there any, you know, is there any danger to doing something like that? Um, I mean, I might not be the right person um, to ask that question because we don't really have a ton of that. Um, yeah. No, okay, so why? 
why does Buffer not have a, a ton of that in place already? Is it just because it's a smaller startup? Is it just you know lots of trust in the in the happiness heroes? Like why? What's the thinking be, behind not stepping that direction yet? <clears throat> yeah, I think Jeff said it really well that like policies often cover the things that you would already sort of do intuitively, um, but they don't cover the edge cases that you would need to discuss. Um, or think about, or uh, you know, might be exceptions to the rule. So, um, I'm not sure that there's like a ton of value. Um, I mean, we do have them. Some of this stuff written down in an internal hack pad, just for people who maybe like want to jump in and answer some questions about a Friday afternoon and aren't doing this day in and day out, and they might, <clears throat> excuse me, not want to, you know, ask what's our refund policy and like that kind of stuff every time. Um, I will say that the we do have a few policies that um, you know are on our terms page that we do we don't put out there very very obviously, um, and we kind of only invoke when we need it, um, which doesn't feel that great. But um, so, and I think that's a thing that we haven't done that well. Um, but it's kind of just because we're like small and it has never been a priority. Um, like one of those is that there's there's certain content that we don't allow to go through buffer. Um, and that's not really a philosophical, moral question about like what kind of brand we want to be. It is a tiny bit, but it's mostly just like that. We don't want our happiness heroes to have to like troubleshoot looking at certain things. Um, so, like that, we're not. We don't like put that out there. We don't really. But but it is technically in our terms and. We do ask, we do shut down accounts for it, but um, we don't actively seek that. We don't actively seek out customers who are sharing that kind of thing. It's just like we just don't want to have to support it because, like, we work from coffee shops and, like, yeah. don't you know? It's like you don't want to have to say, like, send me the image. I'll upload it myself and see if I, you know, like, if it's like something you don't really want to be looking at. So um, that's one that I think we haven't done that well, but it's mostly just because it's a low priority and. Um, and we do re refund those accounts. So if we shut down, it often tends to be paying customers. Um, so we do, we will refund that and make it right and like do right by the customer. But we, um, it does feel a little bit icky sometimes that we have to say, sorry, we know we didn't really warn you about this ahead of time. It is technically in our terms, so uh, we're gonna shut down your account. Um, and they're like, oh, I wish I had not sent, spent all this time and energy. Investing in this particular product when I could have done it elsewhere and not had this experience. So uh, that's one I think we could probably improve on. I don't know the exact answer to that, but um, yeah, uh, in terms of like uh, just the the easy sort of less controversial thing. Um, yeah, we just haven't really had a need for it yet. Yeah, that's probably one of the best parts about you know a service like Basecamp being primarily for internal use between teams. We don't have to deal with any like. Uh, questionable content. That's the phrase that we'll use. Questionable content on things like that. Whereas, you know, um, if you're campaign monitor, if you're MailChimp, you know, you're going through those email newsletters, making sure nobody violates your policies that you've, you know, which is, okay, so I mean, that's a, a pretty good example of when you need to have a, a hard and fast policy in place. It's something that's, you know, here in the U.S., it, there are laws around what you can and cannot send emails about and who you can sign up and who you can't, things like that. So you need hard and fast policies that match what those laws are for the country that you're you're operating in. Um, I, I guess Chase with, with WordPress.com, uh, every now and then you'll see a story about it um, where you know like WordPress goes to court over a uh, takedown notice or something like that. Um, is that something that um, yeah, like Carolyn mentioned, y'all aren't like actively looking for things. It's just you're responding to any takedown notices and, and content questions and things like that as they come in, right? Yeah, for the most part. So we have um, an entire uh, team of happiness engineers um, uh, called the Terms of Service team, basically. And so their um, their job is to make sure that um, you know, number one, that any takedown notices that are sent to us are legitimate. And you know, like like you said, um, it's been pretty. Um, Pretty covered in the news that um, we're we we push back a lot on takedown notices um, because a lot of them are, are not used for legitimate purposes and and luckily and uh, we're in the position where you know we can do that and and um, have the resources to be able to to actually prosecute um, some of those folks 
Um, but also the the terms of service squad also um, you know polices uh, spam and, and that kind of thing. So as you can imagine, on WordPress.com we get a lot of um, just you know crazy spam or um, things that you know we have a, a terms of service as well that that say what you can and can't. Um, you know, post about basically on, on WordPress.com and, you know, we feel like we're, you know, as lenient as we can be, but there are still some things that um, that we don't necessarily want um, our service to be associated with. And so um, I, we do, uh, especially for sp like spam sites and things that are, um, you know, linking out for, uh, for other like monetary gain and stuff, we do seek those out and have tools to, to try to find those and shut those down um, just because it can be, you know, harmful to the to our network and to the other sites that, that we're hosting. Um, so we obviously have, you know, policies and, and um, things around those kinds of sites um, that, that are in violation of our terms of service. Um, so, yeah, that, that is something that we deal quite a bit with. Yeah, and Jeff, when it comes to Wissia and video hosting, I'm guessing that y'all probably have some kind of content guidelines, content policy, that kind of thing in place too, right? Yep, yeah, we do. Um, I wouldn't say that's something that we really have to deal with much in support, though. Um, like, I wouldn't say that that's like a support policy. It's more like a company policy. Does that make sense? So in terms of, like, me setting up processes around that, I don't think that's something that I've ever done. Probably should, though. <laughs> that moment where Jeff realizes what he should be doing with his life, or at least his work life. No, definitely not that one. That, that is not going to crack the top 100, but yeah, it probably should be on there somewhere around item 258, I think. I'll put that on, on there. Yeah, so, uh, still sticking with you, Jeff, at what point does... Chase, let's do this. Yeah. We're going to stick with you or just you're going to take it home. Um, actually, there's another question after this, but for you. <laughs> um, so at what point, you know, uh, Wissy is still, you know, a growing startup, for lack of a better phrase. I mean, it's not a huge team yet. Kind of the same boat where Buffer is. Uh, Chase Livingston, this question does not apply in any way to you. Um, so, Jeff, when you're looking at Wissy, at what point should should a growing startup start thinking about setting policies like these? Start setting, you know, obviously terms of service, content policy, privacy policy, you want to do all that in the beginning. But at what point should they start thinking about, um, you know, kind of figuring out what they're going to do with refunds, figuring out how they're going to handle owner transfers, uh, account transfers, that kind of thing. Like, what? at what point do they sit down and, and figure all that stuff out? So we've already hit it, um, or we've recently What was the number? It, I, I guess. I don't know what the what number, number was. 13? I probably should have done it a long time ago, but it's a little bit more about the, about the pace, I think, of growth. Um, so in the past, it was like you'd add a person, they would have six months to get up to speed, and then at the end of those six months, we'd think about adding somebody else. We grew really, really slowly, right? Now we're, we're growing recently, our support team, at such a pace that the, um, in terms of people who are providing day-to-day -day support, the new people outnumber the experienced folks. Right, and I'm leaning more and more on the experienced folks to help set those processes, lead new people, grow the team footprint in other ways, like that kind of thing. Right, their their growth trajectory or their opportunities are uh, in other areas. It's not just keep doing the same thing you're doing, and that's when it's really important to have this knowledge transfer in place. I think because I was watching the time. You can just watch your in your hip chat room if you have a support hip chat room. You can just watch everyone's time just get decimated by new team members being encouraged to ask questions and then asking questions. Like, you can't, what, what a surprise. But yet the questions that they're asking are around issues that um, everyone else, right, like experienced team members know the answer to because they've done it a million times. Why are we making a new team member rediscover that? Um, and, and so I think that's when it starts to get really valuable to say, like, what are the what are the eighty percent of issues that you know at at a high level we cover day in day out? It's kind of just core to the business that we the business that we've created and the customers that we have, right? And and when you can put those down and and maybe what you do is just go through all of your so we had a practice last night we just went through all of our tickets and and thought about what bucket do these go in and what workflow. Do they are they assigned to and, and and is this something that a brand new person person wow should be able to answer? Um, 
And once you have that list, you know uh, you know what internal documentation you need. You know what knowledge transfer um, you need to be setting up. And I I think I don't know if we've already covered the Matt Patterson article. Um, he had this great article about the cost of creating policies. Um, and uh, you know, as usual, we we agree and we disagree at the same time. Um, I think he's he's absolutely brilliant, and yet in this case, I think he made a number of assumptions that he didn't prove. Um, he's and, shaking his fist at you right now. I hope he is he's from deep, deep in Australia somewhere. He's shaking his fist at me. Um, he made a number of assumptions that I think uh, he needed to prove out, and and maybe he just you know didn't want to go into the depth in the article or. Or whatever, but I, I I haven't seen it yet. So one of which is um, if we have a process and a a, a way of uh, dealing with a certain issue, that uh, a new teammate who's really smart and really driven and really cares won't say, hey, this doesn't make a ton of sense to me, or I don't think we should do it this way. So I guess that what I want to communicate about going back to your question of like when's the right time. Um, part of my calculus for figuring out the right time is not, um, oh, there's no new ways to do support anymore. Like, everything's been figured out, and now all we need is people who just come in and, like, press the press the button, and they just... The code paste in. They Right, they just press in the, the canned response, and they send it, and that's all that they do. Um, but instead, uh, what I want them to get really good at is understanding what our customers want, and what our customers consider to be success, and what issues they run into, and, and what they're frustrated by, and not like, how does ownership transfer work? Should I give this person access? I don't know. This person seems kind of creepy. Um, yeah, it, go from doing that in an ad hoc fashion to go to having that smart default like we talked about before. So I would definitely share that Matt Patterson article in the show notes, and I'm going to stop. Whoa, so you're adding something to the show notes? Wow. Yeah, I figure like that one person like who goes to the show notes for reference will find that article there. <laughs> yeah, and I will say one of the, the things I love uh, about this because I, I remember talking to Matt uh, maybe at one of the one of the user comps or something back before he wrote the article, I think, because he was I remember him working out the idea that uh, he finally landed on in this article, and he put it really well. He, he said that basically um, processes, policies, all that kind of stuff, they should act as safety barriers on a wide-open highway, not as rails on a train line. So they shouldn't be dogmatic. They shouldn't be this is the only way to do things. Um, now, there are going to be situations where you have to do things like that, you know, the takedown notices, the content guidelines, that kind of stuff. But, you know, deciding refunds, deciding whether or not to turn off two-factor authentication and security stuff. I mean, those are things that you're going to have lots of edge cases, so you need those policies more as a guide rather than a, this is exactly the way that you have to do it. I think that it's just safe to assume that we hired the support, we hired great support people because we want them to, um, you know, sound the alarm or, or just bring up conversations about things that really impact the customer experience. And what we, what I didn't hire support people to do, is to sit, is to like sit there and feel really despondent or really unconfident about issues that, mm-hmm. that they, that should be fairly trivial to solve, except they have to bug somebody about it. So I, I, I want them to, to be confident about bigger, le- bigger issues, and and it's hard to be confident in, in bringing up your opinion about those things. When you also don't understand how to solve, how to resolve like what we would consider support 101 in terms mm-hmm. of our day-to-day support, so don't make them guess at that, and don't waste a bunch of your team's time in like reteaching, you know, re- re- reteaching them how to do the support. Just try to. I mean, what we're doing right now is is building that internal knowledge base that covers more of the why rather than the the how. Right? It's not exact mm-hmm. language. And you know, people who have listened to this show for a long time will know I did that a long time ago. Um, but now it's completely out of date, so we got to do it again. Um, but I, I'm really, what's exciting is that this isn't something that um, I decided to do, right? Or that I was like, oh, the, our support has just turned into complete shit. So now we have to write this so that our team will follow the. It was like the new members of the team saying, we want to contribute and we want to feel like we're making a, a positive contribution, and we don't feel like that when every single question we have to ask everybody how to do stuff. So, do that. 
<laughs> help your team be, like, just in the same way that you're trying to help your customer be more confident, help your teammate be more confident, too. And I, I don't I don't yet see, maybe I'll be back in six months, like, crying into my beer, but I don't think that um, we've yet to see people who are really smart say, like, okay, I'm leaving because you guys taught me how to answer this question, and you didn't you didn't let me figure it out on my own. You know, I don't see that happening. Six months. Give it six months. We'll see what happens. Exactly. Um, but I, I do think you kind of bring up a good point there. Um, we'll get Carolyn's thoughts on this. So uh, one of the things that, that really caught my eye, caught my ear, uh, whatever, um, was the fact that uh, it's kind of a, a natural reaction for managers to when when the support goes to shit, for lack of a better phrase, to start trying to implement policies in the hopes that these policies will turn the ship around, since we've all read that book recently. You know, uh, that, the, that the policies will be a silver bullet, a magic thing that they can do. Um, I, I remember this at a, a restaurant I worked at. The new manager came in, new GM came in, and decided that uh, the store wasn't up to his standards, so all of a sudden, out come all of these, like, Leslie Nope guideline policy, thick, thick notebooks. I mean, crazy, crazy amounts of policies and things that he expected would just fix everything. Um, so at Buffer, you know, you, you talked about not having a lot of policies. Is it just because, you know, you've made really, really good hires and then given them that confidence? <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Um, in and bear in mind, this can change it. in like six months, so we won't hold you to anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I definitely identified with Jeff's story of like these things tend to be um, these things tend to come from the new hires, right? So like we don't think to write these things down until like we we, we generally okay. Let me collect my thoughts. For a second. We generally try to take a lean approach to these things, so. If we're not finding that we need to make policies or even write them down, um, then we generally don't do it. Uh, and even if we we like get to this situation where, um, like a couple times, we've realized that one thing comes up and like one extreme edge case, and so we're like, oh, okay, now we need a policy about this. Um, and we've drifted into that a little bit, and I think it's good to. Um, to be on the lookout for that too, because like usually you still don't need a policy about that, even though it has come up. Um, so um, yeah, we. But that being said, like the the we did, you know, about a year ago, we hired our team grew a lot, and um, yeah, those people were kind of saying, like, I had this question, I asked the other new person, that person didn't know, so. Now that I know, I'm just going to write it down so that the next person doesn't have this experience. Um, and especially uh, with a distributed team, because a lot of times, um, like we'll have a conversation in the U.S. in HipChat about how to handle this thing, and then, you know, three months down the line, the person in Australia or Asia is saying like, "Hey, how do we handle this?" Um, we're like, "Oh, yeah, that's not really fair." So, um, yeah, a lot of times they, these things do get just dumped into like hat pads or something. Um, so we have like a very informal, very unorganized internal hat pad that just says like, here are some things that have come up in the past and how we dealt with them. Um, and that a lot of that has, was driven by the people who were new who said like, okay, now I've learned this answer, I'm going to write it down. Um, which is a little hard for me uh, to do because um, I just don't really have I'm pretty distant from the feeling of being brand new and not knowing any of the answers anymore. So um, it's sort of tough for me to really remember all those little things that you know you don't you just take for granted. So, um, and I think that's great. Like to Jeff's point, that's that's perfect that the new hires are coming and saying, "I want to contribute," um, and I felt helpless in the situation and I felt like a little bit silly asking the question. So. Um, you know, I'm going to solve this problem for the for the future. So, um, I think I can't remember what your original question was. Now, <laughs> um, did I touch on it? What was your original question? Yeah, I, I I think you did. It's as far as you know, those policies not being there, um, giving you know, giving that confidence to your team members, knowing that they are the right person, that they they were hired for a reason, that you don't expect them to be code monkeys. And once they do learn these things, you know, passing it on, uh, that transfer of knowledge that Jeff touched on. Yeah, I, I think in your in your Hawaii lingo, you got there. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, and I to that other point, like, um, like that those kinds of questions that can be answered by like that's not those part of sometimes that's fun, right? Like mm -hmm. learning, like thinking through these things and saying, okay, this is how we handled it six months ago. Is this still true anymore? How, what's different about this case, right? And so, um, you know, any like any person can come on board and answer the questions with um, with snippets. It's it's it makes the job fun when you have like some decision making power and so you have to sort of <clears throat> apply your your thoughts to a question and we hire people who we trust to do that. So I, yeah. I think um, the only other thing I wanted to add about that is that it's also about service levels. One something that I've been thinking about lately is. Um, I'm sure every service has this group of questions that come up all the time and they're fairly straightforward. Um, maybe they're not easy, but they're, they're straightforward. And then there's this other group of questions that are really hard and you need to have Buffer or WordPress or Basecamp or Wistia context in order to, um, to resolve them. Like, there's, they're just, they're tough. Maybe they require a ton of time. One of them for us is, um, is related to video SEO. It just requires a good amount of research and time and, and training. Um, and so if you're thinking about creating like a really stellar experience for customers, I mean Basecamp doesn't have this problem. Every single response is like under five minutes. But um, for those of us who work at normal companies, um, uh, if we're going to try to, like wh when we think about providing the, the, the service that we want, it's not possible to take an issue that currently takes an hour or even three hours to debug and take it down to five minutes. That, it's just, it's not physically uh, possible at this point. Um, but what is possible is to take these issues that, that should take one minute, five minutes, um, but currently they're taking like an hour, right, because uh, it's related to like one of our new people like opening up an email and reading it and being like, yeah, I have no idea how to do that. And then opening up the next email and reading that and be like, yeah, I still don't know how to do that one. Next one, next one, next one, until they find something that they've done before. Um, or, you know, pinging the hip chat room and then waiting for somebody else to explain it to them. If we could take that to a place where uh, all of the issues that really are very quick, um, we're able to handle them in a quick manner and we're able to scale that, right, a a a quickly. Um, then, then we can really focus. Then we, then we've bought ourselves the time to focus hard on the really tough issues, and those are the ones that, you know, maybe not in the short term we can't make a, a huge impact, but over the long term, if we actually had the time to think about that instead of fighting fires and like always being behind the eight ball, um, I think you can make a huge impact there. So, yeah, probably just rehashing what I said, but I guess this is just another argument for trying to think through like which. Which issues you want to have people cycles on, and which ones you don't. All right, cool. Uh, that's all the big stuff I had. Any, anybody want to throw in any last minute thoughts before we wrap up this one? All we can hear is like the birds in the ocean roaring in the background from <laughs> Carolyn. Yeah, just. She's actually there. in. Uh, yeah, she's actually in New Jersey. She's just <laughs> running like uh, ocean sounds. <laughs> Joel and was a like, hair, hair he's like in a kitty pool in the background. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let us know how you handle setting up policies and things like that because, like we mentioned at the start of the show, every company is going to do it a little bit differently. Um, some companies are going to have a ton of policies. Some are going to have you know, little to none. Um, so let us know how you're doing that. Supportops.co forward slash contact or tweet at us on Twitter. At support ops. Is tweet just a weird word for me or is that for everybody? It's just a weird word. Um, oh, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. <laughs> uh, New York right. Times agrees with you. See? Well, the New York Times agrees. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that brings us to the favorite part of all of our individual weeks or whatnot. Oh, Carolyn, so close. It was the, the, the lag between us and Hawaii, just a little bit. Oh, sad. <laughs> Snap. Oh, all right. So um, since this is your last couple of days in Hawaii, we'll let you go first. Um, gee, we should get a check cut from, like, the Hawaii Tourism Board or something like that. <laughs> we talked about that. Um, so what's your shout-out for this week? Okay. I have two because um, one's kind of a cheat. 
of the first one, which is a cheat, is um, I want to shout out Pablo, which is made by Buff. Um, but it's just really fun to play around with. Um, it's a way to put text onto pictures really quickly. Um, <clears throat> and I just wanted to sort of give a thumbs up to the amazing team that did that. Um, I wasn't really involved at all, so I can say that. Um, and it's also kind of fun because I often have things, like quotes from books from like Kindle or something, that I want to share but are too long for Twitter. Um, and so we've been playing with using this as kind of a way to share longer quotes that aren't over 100 characters. So um, that's my first shout out. So really, it's a cool tool. Um, if you have a need for this, go check it out. Um, and my real shout out is for Tweetbot um, for improving the experience of making it easier to retweet or buffer a retweet um, through the app. Um, Tweetbot is gets like so many of these types of requests, and they get they're such a small team, um, and they have so many third party apps that want their tool to work better with them. Um, and so I just want to give them a big thanks and shout out for making that uh, making that change. Um, so yeah, I know it's easier to do that. So if, in case you use Tweetbot and you want to buffer retweets, you can do that. Now. I love how like she slides buffer marketing into the shout outs. <laughs> I know usually <laughs> this week is a little bit gross on buff a little bit shameless plugs everywhere, but it's okay, it's allowed. It's it's the I mean it's shout outs. You can do whatever you want with them. Uh, <laughs> speaking of which, Livingston, what's uh, what we got? So uh, yeah, um, Matt Mullenweg, our, our CEO, um, briefly mentioned a uh, an interesting app um, that he's been using um, called Moment for uh, for iPhone. I might be late adopting this. I don't know, but it basically um, like tracks your iPhone usage and tells you where you're spending your time, how often you're picking up your phone, and staring at it, and that kind of thing. And um, so basically what I've learned is that I use my phone a lot every day and uh, I'm not sure if that's good or bad. The little app bar showed me that I'm in the red every day. Um, so apparently they think I'm using my phone too much. Um, I, I don't know that I agree with that necessarily. But anyway, it's uh, kind of an interesting insight, I guess, just uh, uh, another metric to track that um, maybe I should try putting down my phone and going for a walk or something like that. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's neat to check it out. I think uh, you could benefit from it. I, I am anxiously awaiting the day where we get an infographic all about you from all of this data that you're tracking. That's right. No, Such should, buffer did I not give us that. that. Oh, all right, Jeff. What's uh, what's your shout out this week? Okay, I have um, three. The first one is come here, you come on, come on. The first one is that I I think that today is National Dog Day. Yeah. So for everyone who has a dog in our audience, they're the best. Uh, this is Sherman. If you can't see it in the audio, he's really desperate to have his dinner. Um, uh, my second one is to the kind folks at WordPress. Uh, we have been trying to convince the, wor the, the WordPress folks for, I think, since the day I started at Wistia, so four and a half years ago, to um, start supporting Wistia Embeds in the, in the WordPress.com uh, domains. And last week, I, I won't get into the full story, but just out of nowhere, serendipitous connection Andrew Spittle, the, the great Andrew Spittle from Automatic was like, oh yeah, I think I can help with that. And about 25 minutes later, uh, Wissy Embeds are supported in WordPress. So, so the future is here. Let me, let me interject here. That just happened to be our yearly hack day where a lot of our developers work on like fun projects and stuff. So you guys asked at the right time on that day is all I'm saying. That's amazing. Yeah, that's... that's <laughs> That's just in, right. So, so that's a really big deal for our customers. Um, they're very excited about that. So that's number two, and then my my third one, my actual shout out. Well, the other two are shout outs, but my 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 actual shout out for a service is uh, Delighted, um, which is a service focused on um, the NPS measurements that I've been so hot on lately, and we just did our first quarterly measurement. Um, and they did an absolute flawless job. They handled uh, 10,000 uh, plus emails with no problem, and their interface has also made it pretty easy, easy for me to sort through um, a lot, a lot, a lot of responses. 
um, and start categorizing them and, and tracking down people for more feedback and all kinds of cool stuff. So um, the other one that we looked at was Promoter IO, and we just went with Delighted in this case, but I highly recommend checking those both out. See, we got to have a show in the future about NPS because that was one of those you asked me about it, and I just wanted to be like, Jeff, why? Why? So we'll have a whole show about it. It'll be fun. You betcha. I guess. It'll give us something to argue about. It's going to be great. Um, all right. <laughs> Oh, shout out for me this week uh, is a shameless sh uh, self plug. We're going to go the buffer route and, and just shamelessly plug here. Uh, next week, next Monday, we're doing our second rapid fire episode. Uh, we only have done one of these so far, and it turned out really well. We just haven't done one in a while. So um, I wanted to do a second one. We're going to do it next week. Uh, really simple. Just send us your question. It can be as short or as long as you want. We're going to try to answer as many questions as we can um, in the uh, the shortest amount of time that we can. Well, I mean, not too short. I mean, normal episode <laughs> length. You know, we're not going to go three hours into this rapid fire. It's called rapid for a reason. Um, but send us your questions. Supportups.co forward slash contact. We're going to compile all of those, and then we'll uh, take turns answering those next week, next Monday. Uh, it's going to be great. It's going to be fun. Rapid fires are always a lot of fun, or at least I think so. I think I just drag the other people along with me. I don't know. <laughs> Let's do some tough ones. Let's do this. <laughs> Jeff, tell me about NPS inside of three minutes. Go. <laughs> oh, it'll be a lot of fun. So get us your questions, supportoffs.co forward slash contact, or like we mentioned, you can tweet at us. Still a weird word. You can send us a tweet at supportops on Twitter. Um, yeah, I would say Facebook, but I'm not really on Facebook. So those are your two options, the website and Twitter. All right, uh, we'll have all those, the, the article links and everything else up in the show notes. Supportops.co is where all of that will be as soon as we get everything uploaded and ready to go tomorrow. Um, that's it. We'll see you next week for the Rapid Fire Show, Monday, 5.30 p.m. Central Time. Until then, have an awesome week.